Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday in the middle of August. We join together in our homes and with the help and participation of Judy and Lynn and Matthias, thank you. And today we'll look at a wonderful passage in Galatians and what it means to be one in Christ. Let me begin with a vision of the throne room in heaven from the book of Revelation. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands upon ten thousands. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. We begin with our opening hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let us pray. Lord, we worship you today, together with your church all over the world, from every tribe and language and people and nation, we join together to praise you. And we thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. Thank you that when you died on the cross, Lord Jesus, that the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Thank you that we have the privilege to enter into the most holy place, into your presence. Lord, open our eyes and open our hearts so that we can see your glory and your greatness today. Be near to us, O Lord, be near to us. Lord, we confess that at times we have turned away from you. At times we live without thinking about you or we make decisions without wanting to do your will. And sometimes we find ourselves far away from you. Lord, we take this time to confess our sin in the quietness of our hearts at this moment. Thank you, Lord that you hear our prayers. Thank you that your forgiveness is freely available. 
Thank you that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And thank you for grace that has come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And thank you, Jesus, for teaching us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's continue to worship through our youth message and anthem. Good morning and welcome to the youth message portion of our service today. It really was only a matter of time before a youth message came to you from my kitchen. And this is the week. Have you ever noticed that prepared food is never ready instantly? I can't just say today's lunch is craft dinner, snap my fingers and have the food ready to eat in my bowl. This is because food or meals take time to prepare. Things need to be washed, they need to be chopped, they need to be cooked, they need to be mixed before they can be served. And depending on what you're making, you might even need one of these, which is a handy timer to make sure that your food is cooked and not burnt. Now here at the Lidkey House, we use our microwave all the time to help us get meals ready. And that's because it has this lovely feature called sensor cook, which is a preset timer built into the microwave. And all I have to do is look on the inside of the microwave, match the item that I want to cook to the number that should be on the screen and press start. Then I can turn my attention to all of the other things that we're cooking in the kitchen for that particular meal, which all have their own preset time for preparation. Now all of this talking about cooking and timing, well it really, I mean it only makes sense that it gets me thinking about Mary and the arrival of Jesus. Now Mary, she was a distant relative of King David and she was someone who loved God and listened to God and obeyed God when he spoke to her and that made her special. Long ago, God made a promise that he would send a savior into the world and he would come from the line of David and he would enter the world as a baby and he would save us from our sins. But no one knew when that was going to happen except for God. Galatians chapter four, verse four says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman under the law. God's plan meant that Jesus came into the world as a baby. He experienced the challenges of growing up just like you do. He experienced being loved and being a part of an earthly family. And all this time that Jesus spent on earth um, was leading up to the events on the cross that we know as Easter. Everything about Jesus's arrival, his life and his death happened on a schedule, not our schedule. It happened on God's schedule. And that's the piece that we can take with us today. Sometimes we don't know why things are happening and when they will end. We only see a small part of the world and of God's plan. But God, well, he has the master blueprints. So this week, when you see your family making a meal and watching the time, Remember, God planned the arrival of Jesus to happen at just the right time, and his plan is still in action today. So until next week, God remembers you, God hears your prayers, and God loves you.
scripture reading today is taken from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 to chapter 4, verse 7. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. And there is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise. Chapter 4. My point is this. Heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you no longer are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, through the spirit of your son, guide us into your truth today. Help us to hear your word and allow it to go deep into our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Do fences make good neighbors? Well, I suppose if it's a good fence, if the intention for building the fence was for good purposes and the fence is useful and it's well built, then it can be helpful for neighbors. In that sense, it's like having good boundaries and uh, protection and privacy and keeping pets contained and allowing both neighbors to enjoy their properties. In that sense, good fences do make good neighbors. If one neighbor has a swimming pool and there's a fence around it and it keeps the other neighbor's children from falling into the pool, then that would be a good fence. In our scripture reading this morning, it talks about the law, or the law of Moses, as being our disciplinarian before faith in Christ came about. In a sense, the law of Moses was like a fence. It provided boundaries, and it it established the way that the Lord would relate to his chosen people, the Israelites. And at the core of Mosaic law is the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And you shall not covet. Well, along with the Ten Commandments, there were moral laws describing what was right and wrong in the eyes of the Lord. There were judicial laws to allow proper justice when a wrong had been done or a crime committed. Uh, there were ceremonial or liturgical laws describing religious festivals and uh, the sacrificial system and how the temple was to operate. 
There were dietary laws about what could and could not be eaten. All told, there were 613 uh, mitzvot or commandments in the law of Moses. And in a sense, this allowed the Israelites and the Lord God to be good neighbors, to live in a right relationship. And this was even more necessary because the neighbors weren't equals. God is described as transcendent and immortal and holy, uh, while humanity is earthly and mortal and sinful. There was a need for boundaries. Even with the physical layout of the temple, there were fences or walls or boundaries. The outer area was called the court of the Gentiles, where foreigners or non-Jews were allowed, but no further than that. There is a famous artifact, part of the wall of Herod's temple, that was found in 1871, called the Soreg inscription. And the writing is in Greek, and it tells the non-Jews to keep out. No foreigner is allowed to enter the barriers surrounding the sanctuary. He who is caught will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. This was as far as the Gentiles were allowed. For the inner area of the temple, there was the court of women. And beyond that was the court of Israel for men only. Beyond that was the court of priests. And the building in the middle of the temple was called the holy place. And inside the holy place was uh, the holy of holies behind a thick curtain, the most holy place. And behind that thick curtain was the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, between the wings of the gold cherubim on top of the ark was called the mercy seat, or the place where God would meet with his people. And the high priest on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, would enter into the most holy place to make sacrifice. Boundaries in this case were, were necessary and good, but there still was something missing. Robert Frost, the famous American poet, used the phrase, good fences make good neighbors, in his 1914 poem, Mending Wall. It's a short poem about two neighbors who have a stone wall that separates their farms, and every year they meet at the wall to fix any damage that was caused over the winter to mend it. One neighbor questions whether they need a wall at all since they don't have cattle or livestock. The other neighbor simply adheres to that old adage, good fences make good neighbors. It's an interesting poem because it highlights the tension between what it means to have good boundaries and what it means to be a good neighbor. Perhaps Good neighbors don't need such concrete and inflexible boundaries. And the Apostle Paul speaks about this problem with the law. It was a rules-based relationship that wasn't life-giving. According to our scripture reading, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law, and the law was our disciplinarian. And the word for a disciplinarian could be translated as guardian or custodian, or supervisor. It's the idea that the law was put in place to protect and to look after minors and children. I can't imagine being the parents of young children during this time of pandemic. When our kids were young, both Moore and I, we just struggled to get our kids to school on time and then also to remember to pick them up. But this year, the kids have been home for months, and now it's the summer. And some parents have had to work all throughout this time. As well, there have been very few extra supports like 
organized sports or lessons or after school programs or extended family being available. I saw some funny pictures of uh, about kids at home during uh, the pandemic. Uh, one was of a little girl hugging her cat and the cat looked very awkward with one eye open and it looked afraid. And the caption had the cat saying, the children are home from school indefinitely. Send help. Another was of the picture of a bathroom door and the caption said, wife wanted five minutes alone and this was outside her door. And in the picture there's a dog and three cats and a little toddler waiting outside the door, waiting for the door to open. Another was a picture of a daily entry to a journal, and this was of a child named Ben, and the writing looked very, you know, young. It was from someone in grade one or two, and it said, March 16, 20, it's not good. My mom's getting stressed out. My mom is getting really confused. We took a break so mom can figure this stuff out. And I'm telling you, it is not good. That was the journal entry for Ben. Well, I thought these were funny pictures that I hope doesn't fully describe the time that you are having if you have young children at home with you. You know, the truth is that I've talked to a few parents and even though it's been hard and difficult and stressful, it's also been invaluable as family time. Parents have had more time to be with their kids. They've had more uh, time to be hands-on and to be present in the lives of their children. And I pray that that input into their lives would help them to grow up to be more confident and resourceful and wise and knowing that they are loved by their mom and their dad and knowing that God loves them as well. That's the shift that happens in our scripture reading. It goes from a rules-based system to adoption into God's family, to becoming children of God. The Apostle Paul wrote that the law was our disciplinarian before, but when Christ came, we are justified by faith. We are no longer uh, subject to a disciplinarian. Instead, we have been made children of God because we were baptized into Christ. We have been clothed with Christ. And Paul then makes a most amazing statement. And it dismantles many walls and fences. There is no longer Jew or Gentile or Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul wasn't saying that there are now no distinctions anymore, but that the walls have been broken down. Cultural and religious heritage doesn't make one person better than another. Social status and wealth doesn't make one person better than another. Gender, and particularly being male, doesn't make one person better than another. This was a powerful statement that at the time was unique to Christian faith. And it was the result and the outcome of having faith in Christ. The churches in the province of Galatia had both Jewish or um, Jewish and Gentile or Greek Christians. They struggled to know how much of their religious of their Jewish uh, religious practices were to be kept and what the Gentiles were supposed to follow as well. Gentiles didn't follow the law of Moses. They didn't uh, consider themselves a child of Abraham. So some were arguing that 
male Gentiles should be circumcised and that they should follow Jewish dietary laws in order to be a Christian. These were known as Judaizers. But the Apostle Paul disagreed. And in the passage just before our scripture reading, Paul said that no one is justified before God by the law. We are justified only by the work of Christ and only by faith in Christ. And in our passage, Paul writes that when we are in Christ, both Jews and Greeks are part of the family of God. The second phrase is that we are no longer slave or free. And this was an early message of emancipation. Even though Paul didn't call for the abolition of slavery, the result of having faith in Christ led to this statement about there is no longer slave or free and being one in Christ. And the Apostle Paul repeated this in his letter to the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 11. The bishop, N.T. Wright, said that the Christian church over the centuries forgot about their calling to this new humanity, to being one in Christ. This vision of equality and, in a sense, anti-racism was picked up by the secular enlightenment. The bishop writes, the Christian churches, by and large, left out a big element in the understanding and application of their own central faith. The secular world has picked it up. This is typical of various cultural moves that have been made in the last two or three hundred years. God, one might reflect, doesn't lack witnesses. If the church doesn't speak up, others may do it instead. Sometimes, as Jesus warned, the children of this age are wiser than the children of light. But as we looked at it in a previous sermon, uh, Christians finally did pick up the torch with the likes of John Newton and William Wilberforce and John Wesley, who called for the abolition of slavery. The third phrase is that there is no longer male and female. And this was an early call for gender equality. Now this is interesting because there are other letters written by the Apostle Paul that seem to suggest otherwise, particularly two passages in 1 Corinthians and one in 1 Timothy. These three passages seem to argue against women in leadership in the church. And those who hold to this position would say that these three passages are normative and binding. Those who argue for women in leadership in the church would take these three passages in the context of the culture of the day and of each particular uh, struggle that the church was facing at the time. Now these three passages, the two in 1 Corinthians, one in 1 Timothy, aren't entirely clear. But Galatians 3.28 is clear. There is no longer male and female. And in practice, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul included women in their public ministry well beyond the limits of the culture of their day. All of this was the result and the outcome of having faith in Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And in chapter 4, verse 4, it says, In the fullness of time, uh, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. You know, there's a sense that the barriers or the, the walls or the fences that were in the temple have been dismantled and taken away because of the redeeming work of Christ. Through Christ, we have been given a new standing before God. We have been made children of God. The story is told of a king who was in his throne room holding counsel with his advisors, with dignitaries and with other heads of state. And suddenly there was a bang and a clatter at the door and 
The door to the throne room was thrust open and a young boy ran into the room with all eyes on him. One of the royal guards uh, tried to stop the boy. Hold there, lad, he shouted. Don't you realize you're disturbing the counsel of the king? Well, he may be your king, said the little boy, but he's my daddy. And the boy bounced into the open arms of his father, the king. That's the richness of the relationship and the standing that we have been given through Christ. We have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you today knowing that you have made us children and heirs in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for entering into this world and for breaking down walls, walls that separate us from you and us from each other. Help us to live out our faith and to lean on you and your redeeming work. Help us to live out our faith and to allow you to break down walls that we may have against our neighbor or walls that others may have as well. Help us to find unity and oneness in Christ. Lord, we pray for the world at this time. We pray for those suffering from oppression and violence, for those going through disaster and displacement with nowhere to live or lacking enough food or water. And we ask that you would grant favor to those working in the area of crisis relief and sustainable development in human rights, help our faith to make a difference in these areas. We continue to pray for those suffering from illness as a result of the pandemic or those uh, with health problems. We ask for your healing hand to be with them. Thank you for answering prayer for those in our church who have gone through recent surgery or health crises. We pray that even during this time, that you would strengthen our faith and broaden our witness to you, that we may be your ambassadors in the world, that we may represent you well instead of being our own person, and that we may be the perfume and the fragrance of Christ to others. We pray for our families and for parents who are unsure about the school situation for their children for the worries and stresses that they are going through. Lord, even at this time, be present. Give wisdom and faith to our families as it continues to be a very difficult year. Thank you that you hear our prayers and that you take even our requests into consideration as you reign and as you work. Lord, let your kingdom come into our lives today and into our world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for today's announcements, I'd like to refer us to uh, our weekly email or to our website under news and events. All of the latest happenings are there. There are meat pies for sale. There's news about our old-time Christmas Bazaar. There's an update on masks and information about our golf day. Uh, but I do want to highlight a couple of ways that we can give. First, uh, Presbyterian World Service and Development is receiving funds to aid people affected by the disaster in Beirut. So any donations made up to August 24th will be matched by the Canadian government and you can give either directly to PWSD or specify your donation through the church and we will pass it on. Second, of course, we can give offering to God. And let's not give because we are obliged, let's give because uh, we are thankful for every blessing that God has given. Again, you can give by three ways. One is you can put it in the mail, you can put it in our mail slot on the south side of the church, or by e-transfer to uh, give to Standrews, all one word, at gmail.com, 
with a note in the memo uh, with your contact information. Well, let's join together with an offering prayer. Lord, we thank you for your provision and your blessing in our lives. Thank you that you were willing to give your son for the sins of the world. And so we give our offerings to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's close with a benediction. Now to him who, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Our final song is, We Are One in the Spirit. <laughs>